I'm Jim Kramer. I'm a consultant. I'm part of the consulting team that was hired by Governor Inslee's office to conduct the Lower Snake River Dam stakeholder engagement process. Uh, we're the ones that produced a draft report that is out in circulation for public comment. Um, and we are going to <clears throat> provide you an uh, uh, evening uh, program tonight for two hours. Uh, I'll give a short presentation, and then these folks up on the stage are going to provide their different perspectives and have a conversation. We are not taking public testimony tonight, uh, but we encourage public comment. Um, there's in your uh, little program, there's both a comment card uh, that you can submit as well as uh, you can go online uh, to the website that's at the end of the program <clears throat> and get the report and also provide a comment via that uh, online website as well as answer a questionnaire if you'd like to. <clears throat> we are going to take some audience questions, but we'd like you to write them down on the uh, question comment piece that's also in your program. Um, I'd ask you to just wait uh, to write your question until you've at least heard the introductions to the panel, um, so you can be asking them questions. We obviously won't be able to get through all the questions and any that we can't uh, go through tonight, we will uh, respond to on our website um, as well. So <clears throat> I wanted to start by expressing my respect for the Columbia Basin tribes uh, that have been affected over the decades by the, some of the issues that we're talking about tonight. And I also want to express my respect for uh, the citizens of central and southeast Washington that are deeply affected by the issues we're going to be talking about. Um, it's very important to me personally um, that um, people are acknowledged uh, despite what you have in terms of perspectives on the dams themselves, because these issues are near and dear to people's hearts and minds. <clears throat> so the purpose of tonight's workshop is to inform people on the content of the draft report. That's also the purpose of the boards outside. We'll end around 8.30 our program. You're welcome to uh, go out and look at the board some more, have conversations. The panel members will introduce themselves in a minute. Um, after I give a short overview, <clears throat> we'll be available for conversation as well. Um, so I encourage you to stay after the program. <clears throat> the agenda basically for tonight is to uh, provide the overview, have a panel discussion, and then move into the open house again. Um, the purpose of the report, which was funded by the Washington State Legislature, is to summarize the views of Washingtonians on retaining or on breaching the Lower Snake River dams. <clears throat> it's to inform Governor Inslee for his input into the federal hydro system process. As some of you may know, there will be an EIS, Environmental Impact Statement, issued by the federal agencies that operate the Columbia River hydro system in February, so next month. Uh, for public review and comment. Um, the purpose of our report is to provide some of the information that Governor Inslee wants to have and the perspectives from Washingtonians on the Lower Snake River dams for his consideration in terms of what he provides in terms of input into that federal process. <clears throat> we were tasked as a consultant team to summarize the issues and the potential opportunities for making progress and very important to acknowledge and respect the values of the di different interests that are involved in this issue. In terms of the process, we were basically started working in uh, September. Uh, we were to provide the final report to the governor with revisions and responses to the comments that we hear to the draft report uh, by <clears throat> the early part of March. Uh, we've interviewed over 90 leaders across these issues, uh, people that work for the ports, uh, for um, the different agricultural interests, uh, salmon interests, conservation interests, and others uh, to gather those perspectives that are of interest to the governor. Um, and that was the basis along with doing research of thousands of pages of documents that have been written on these issues over the last couple of decades. 
We also launched, as I mentioned, we have an online survey that's open until January 24th. Um, so far we have about 6,000 responses to that survey, and I'm assuming we'll get a number more before the deadline on January 24th. <clears throat> and then we have the three scheduled workshops. This is the last of the three. Uh, last week we had on Tuesday, January 7th, a uh, workshop in Clarkston, uh, the 9th in Vancouver, and tonight is the final one here in the Tri-Cities area. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, our report uh, is due to the governor by early March. It will also be publicly available at that time as well. In terms of the report itself, uh, we've, there's lots of ways you can kind of lump and split the issues that are involved with the Lower Snake River dams. Um, our kind of approach to it is to <clears throat> gather the comments and the information that we've researched and the perspectives uh, based upon these different topics, uh, ecological salmon orca, uh, energy, agriculture, transportation, recreation, economics, and then the last section is moving forward. Uh, we were not uh, asked by the governor's office to make recommendations, uh, but we asked the people that we interviewed for what their recommendations are for moving forward. You'll hear some of those tonight from our panel members. Um, and also, we definitely would be interested as you provide public comment uh, on the draft report uh, through written comments, your ideas for how to move forward on these issues. Salmon, farming, hydropower are fundamental to Washington's past and future. They are part of what symbolizes who we are as residents of the Pacific Northwest and define our communities and our economies. The Lower Snake River dams have touched all of these issues since they were constructed over 40 years ago. They represent positive gains to the economy and local communities in Southeast Washington as well as losses to tribal and fishing communities. Interestingly to me and others of us that worked on this, the natural and human systems that support salmon, orca, farming, hydropower, and our local economies have similar characteristics that must be understood to make wise decisions about the future, whether the lower Snake River dams are breached or retained. They all include the importance of reliability, flexibility, diversity, and timeliness to be successful. That's true of how we work to manage salmon. It's true of how we work to manage hydropower. It's true of how we work to, to manage the other issues. Each system is complex and dynamic, and with changes predicted in the future that will increase the challenges as well as the opportunities. In our report, we summarize the complex and dynamic nature of these systems, as well as the range of perspectives. In terms of ecological change in salmon and orca, <clears throat> the Lower Snake River has been significantly altered from its historic conditions. The Lower Snake River dams transformed the lower 140 miles into a series of slack water reservoirs which affect the migration of salmon downstream and upstream. However, the major tributaries to the Lower Snake are some of the most pristine habitat left in the Columbia Basin, but is underutilized by low salmon returns. Historically, about a million and a half Chinook annually return to the Snake River. Now the returns range from three to 10%. The decline is attributed to many factors, including the Snake and Columbia River dams, predators, climate change, and ocean conditions, just to name a few. Significant investments have been made to the dams and habitat and hatcheries to support the current levels of salmon that we see returning to the system. And there are major differences in people's perspectives on the results of breaching. Some believe that the river and its floodplain will be worse from breaching, sediment, pollution, invasive species. Others predict, based upon results of dam breaching in other areas, a river that relatively quickly resembles its former form and function. These differences range <clears throat> significantly and also relate to the benefits that people see for the southern resident killer whales where some see other actions as more important, like improving the environmental conditions of Puget Sound 
and others see breaching the dams as one of the most significant actions to improve salmon abundance, abundance for the orca. There's also a question about how soon the benefits would actually be achieved. The energy environment uh, that the hydropower fits into is also equally complex and dynamic with changes predicted in the future. Over the last decade, the energy market has gone through large-scale transformation, wide-scale development of renewable resources, wind and solar, improvements to energy efficiency, low-cost gas, natural gas generation, and periods of oversaturated markets. And recently, last year, the Washington State Legislature passed the Washington Clean Energy Act, which requires greenhouse gas-free electricity by 2045, which also requires significant changes to occur. Despite the small percentage and infrequent use of power from the Lower Snake River dams, people see them as critical to the transmission flexibility, meeting the summer peak demand in the Tri-Cities, and backup for the overall Bonneville Power Administration's power system during peak periods or unexpected losses for other sources. While others believe that with the current alternatives and future opportunities, the power from the dams could be replaced with a thoughtful plan over the next several years. <clears throat> Farming and transportation, at least as they relate to the Lower Snake River dams, are critically tied together. Southwest, Southeast Washington, with over 5 million acres of farmland, the rolling hills of the Palouse, grow the nation's richest crops of wheat, barley, lentils, and chickpeas. Wheat grown in the Palouse yields up to 100 bushels per acre, which is twice the natural average, national average. Lake Sac Sacagawea, the reservoir created by Ice, ha Ice Harbor Dam, supports about 50,000 acres of irrigated farmland, including fruit trees and vegetables like onions and potatoes and sweet corn. The local grain economy relies on a complex set of relationships between the grain producers, the farmers, the cooperatives, the <clears throat> transporters, the exporters, and customers, all of whom are a part of an equally complex and competitive global, global marketplace. Over the past 20 years, transportation infrastructure in southeast Washington around the Lower Snake River dams has evolved. Investments have been made in capacity for rail, for <clears throat> port terminals, and for barging. Supporters of breaching the dams believe that significant investments could be made to improve rail and road infrastructure needed by agriculture, as well as provide subsidies for increased costs to farmers of both dry land and irrigated farmland. In the long run, they believe the costs may be less than maintaining the dams and locks, which need more and more maintenance and repair as they age, and could provide a more reliability. Others question the willingness of the federal government and the region's ratepayers to provide the funding for infrastructure and increased operating costs. They are also concerned about the ability to compete in a global marketplace if delivery of their products is less certain and more costly. Recreation is another area where people disagree significantly. The current system supports a number of water-based recreation, boating, swimming, fishing, and tourism. Uh, numerous re recreation facilities are operated and supported by local, state, and federal agencies. Um, and there's a question about if the dams were breached, how you would pay for the costs and the kinds of improvements needed to those recreation facilities. Supporters of restoring the Lower Snake Dam to a free-floating river argue that the river is currently underused for recreation, citing national and regional research findings that a river environment is preferred over lake recreation. And breaching the Lower Snake River dams would open new opportunities for trails, campgrounds, and other recreation-based infrastructure that could connect the communities surrounding the Lower Snake River dams. <clears throat> Others believe the current recreation system is much more significant than what would be if the river was free flowing and don't understand how the recreation facilities would be changed or maintained if the federal agencies are no longer involved and responsible. 
and then economics, which obviously brings all of those issues together. There's really only two comprehensive studies that have been done uh, over the last 20 some years uh, related to the Lower Snake River dams. One in 2002 by the Army Corps of Engineers as part of the environmental impact statement that was issued in 2002, and one more recently last year by Eco, Econ Northwest. <clears throat> Both of those uh, have information that is going to be updated significantly in the uh, federal EIS that's coming out in February. So we'll see some new numbers in terms of the economics. And then recently, last week, the Pacific Northwest Waterways Association also issued an economic study that they had conducted over the last few months. Both of those uh, will be significant to adding to our knowledge base about the cost and benefits of both the Snake River dams as well as the rest of the Columbia River system. <clears throat> both of those previous uh, economic studies basically identified that there would have to be a significant shift or an infusion of new money to address the impacts of breaching. Uh, and obviously those uh, perspectives differ significantly in terms of economics um, on the side of folks that support keeping the dams, a, a great consideration and concern about the loss of the barge transportation, the increased cost, and if that cost is not covered by other sources, that you will see a dramatic effect on the ability for farmers in the region to be profitable into the future. <clears throat> And then lastly, in terms of just a quick summary of the report, uh, moving forward, what we heard from many people is that this cycle of study lawsuits and court decisions that have occurred over the last 20 plus years is something that they're wary of and are hoping that there can be a new approach to dealing with the issues. There's both despair and hope about what comes next, despair that we will stay locked in this cycle uh, where People are basically going to court, uh, but not making progress. Um, and also hope that we can find a way to move forward differently than what's been the past. The other uh, two recommendations that we heard from people about moving forward, one is that decisions are made in a larger context. And in terms of what they mean by that is that you can't address salmon recovery just by whether you decide that the Lower Snake River dams stay or go. You have to look at the broader issue of salmon recovery in the whole Columbia River system and how it's managed in the oceans and between the countries, both our country and Canada, <clears throat> that managed harvest and other aspects of the salmon efforts. <clears throat> the same is true for energy, that you can't make a decision just on whether the Snake River dams go or come, you have to understand the future <clears throat> and how they fit into the overall system and what changes are going to occur. And that's what people meant by consider a larger time frame. That things are going to change relative to all these issues in the future, and we need to be taking that into account as we think about what decisions need to be made, both in terms of uh, what we have in front of us today, but also in terms of what is coming in the future. And then lastly, <clears throat> a call for future processes need to demonstrate respect and support, especially for tribes, for Eastern Washington and coastal fishing communities. That those communities, at least in our conversations, feel that they've been disrespected and not acknowledged for their value uh, from past processes involved with these efforts, and that the future needs to very clearly and intentionally demonstrate that respect and acknowledge the importance of those different communities. So what we have next is a panel discussion. Um, I've asked these 10 individuals to, who are all volunteering their time for this purpose and uh, come from different parts of the state. Um, and. I originally sent out an email yesterday saying, it looks like the weather will be fine, according to the weather report. Um, <clears throat> obviously, they don't always get it right uh, and either. So I, I appreciate that they all made it. Some made it about 20 minutes before we started the program, um, and others were able to get here a little sooner. But anyway, I greatly appreciate their efforts to get here today for our last uh, workshop. 
So what I've asked them to do is to introduce themselves. And I've asked them not to advocate one way or the other for the dams coming, going or staying, but to talk about what, they, what their connection is to the issues, what they value, and why they're working hard to support their various communities and the issues that surround this. <clears throat> and then after their introductions, which I've asked them to be brief, um, but, but mention those things that I just said, we're going to start out their conversation by asking what concerns you about the issues that have been dealt with over the years regarding the Snake River dams, salmon, orca, energy, agriculture, transportation, or recreation, and what would be helpful moving forward. Uh, we'll start interspersing your questions uh, into their discussion as, as you um, submit them. Uh, if you want a question, uh, just kind of send it to the aisle, uh, and we'll pick them up. Um, and then we'll uh, screen them for kind of how we can lump them together and ask some of the panel. And again, uh, at least in the last two workshops, we got way more questions than we could ask them. And we're committed to uh, review those questions and provide answers either from the panel or from our consultant team uh, in the final report that we provide. So with that, uh, the panel is listed in front of you. The list goes from basically your right. Is that what he said? Your, my left, sorry. <laughs> I'm dyslexic also, so. Um, <clears throat> from my left or their left to the right. Um, so you can remember who's in it. You also have their bios in the piece, so. They will, yeah, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna start with David Johnson. And please give him the microphone. Good evening, my name's Dave Johnson and I work with the Nez Perce Tribe, I'm the Fisheries Department Manager and be careful when you are driving home, it was really treacherous coming over. I've been uh, working on fisheries issues in the Snake River Basin uh, with respect to the exercise of treaty fishing rights and on habitat fisheries issues since 1983, and then as the manager of the fisheries department since 2002. So just for location uh, purposes, where the tribe's country is located, uh, the tribe ceded lands essentially that, that go from uh, Little Goose Dam in the east. They go south across the Blue Mountains down into the Eagle Caps, and then uh, east from there over to the Montana border with Idaho and then back, uh, back up, uh, up that uh, Montana border and across the Clearwater. Uh, so those lands cover um, the Minam and the Wanaha wilderness areas. They also cover uh, part of the Frank Church and then the, all of the Selway Bitterroot uh, wilderness area. The tribe's goals entail restoring healthy and harvestable returns of the salmon and steelhead in the Snake River Basin and fairly sharing the conservation burden. Uh, as a department, we grow millions of hatchery fish every year. Uh, we implement one of the largest habitat restoration programs in the Snake River Basin, and uh, we participate in the management of the hydroelectric system to reduce its impacts to salmon and monitor and regulate our treaty fisheries. Uh, despite these across-the-board efforts, our ability to affect populations in the vast amount of wilderness areas that, that are present in the Snake River Basin are limited. And uh, so what we're interested in with this particular project is we think that there's so much that needs to happen uh, in out-of-basin areas and uh, the dams being the largest of the man-made uh, impacts in this uh, stretch of the river uh, we feel need to be addressed. Good evening, friends. My name is Alex McGregor. Our family business serves farm families uh, in 36 communities uh, east of the Cascades. Our headquarters is in Colfax. Also at the tiny town of Hooper, we have raised wheat and livestock for just shy of 140 years. I've been interested in issues related to farm families for a long time, and anything we can do to help them, we work very hard to do. One issue that stands out I want to mention briefly, the governor has asked how services provided by the dams could be replaced, what it could cost, 
We just need to get to the facts. The costs in dollars would be staggering. Irrigators would face as many as 90,000 acres impacted, cost 446 to 622 million dollars. Replacing a third of the branch lines uh, now, re now removed with a few new facilities uh, to handle grain would cost just shy of half a billion dollars, not including buying or condemning 300 miles of track where right-of-ways have, have uh, been sold. Cost for waterways, $2.3 billion. This wall, alas, falling backwards in managing greenhouse gases for shipping by barge produces 86% fewer hydrocarbons than trucks, 80% less than rail. Farms and communities, large and small, uh, would suffer, as with the Tri-Cities, where leaders fear losses of 15,000 jobs, as they put it, in our thriving agricultural food processing and wine industries that are the backbone of our region's economy. Mathematical calculations, no matter how large, are but part of the equation. Agriculture is a hard way to make a living, and the goals that drive us to see the land in better shape at the end of our tour of stewardship than when we began, to feed hungry people around the world, those go beyond dollars and cents. Pulling together, building on the hard work of so many, including our panelists, we can save our iconic salmon without dismembering efficient, environmentally sound transport or returning our fertile lowlands to deserts of sage and sand. It is not an either-or proposition. Washington can have both healthy rivers and a healthy economy. Uh, good evening. My name's Joel Kawahara. I'm a commercial fisherman from Quilcene, Washington. Whoever it was that asked where we're from, that's west of Seattle, about 35 miles in rural uh, Jefferson County. And I don't expect you to know where Quilcene is, because I don't know where. Uh, Hooper? Hooper. Yeah. I don't know where Hooper is. <clears throat> so um, I've, been a I've been a fisherman my entire life. Uh, I started commercial fishing as a teenager, helping somebody in Nia Bay, Washington in 1972. In that time period, in the state of Washington, there were a little over 3,000 individual permits, which involve either one or two people on a boat, uh, delivering salmon into uh, Washington state ports. And as of uh, 2018, there were 108 individual permits landing fish into uh, Washington state. So I'm, that's a concern to me. Uh, in Alaska, where, where a lot of us went in the 1990s, uh, restrictions began about and culminated in the 80s and culminated with the implementation of the Pacific Salmon Treaty in 1985, structured to improve natural runs of salmon uh, coastwide, including in the Columbia Basin, that those uh, treaties set quotas and restricted the number of Chinook that were caught in Alaska. In 1999, a 15% reduction for a 10-year period was implemented, and then in 2000, uh, excuse me, in uh, 1999, a 15% reduction in Canada was implemented. In 2009, a 15% reduction in both Canada and Alaska were implemented, and then in 2019, 18, the last round of that treaty, another 7.5% reduction in Chinook were implemented. So a lot of those, Reductions are for um, Snake River and Columbia River fish. That causes a lot of hardship for our industry, and that's a lot of why I'm here. Good evening. I'm Kieran Connolly. I'm the Vice President of Generation Asset Management at the Bonneville Power Administration. I've been with Bonneville for 28 years. Uh, most of that spent located in Portland, Oregon. Uh, what brought me to Bonneville uh, was that the Bonneville Power Administration is a federal power marketing administration, which doesn't mean much to you, but I'll explain it a little bit. 
really, we're part of the federal government, but we are self-funded through the rates that our customers, the retail utilities, pay to Bonneville. So we have to operate like a business. The interesting part about that is we're not operating as a business to make a profit. We have statutory mandates for the services <coughs> that we provide to the region. And those include low rates to our utility customers, spreading electricity benefits to residential and small farm consumers throughout the region. So even if you're not a Bonneville customer, if the rates you pay through your utility are higher than what you would pay for Bonneville, we cut a check to that utility. So I have an investor-owned utility that serves my house. There's a little tiny credit on the back of my bill that says you're getting benefits from the federal government for the benefits of the federal Columbia River power system. We also fund significant conservation programs and have done so for decades in the region. We've, we've saved the amount of electricity equivalent to two cities of Seattle over the last 20 years at Bonneville, and again, in partnership with our utility customers who pay those bills. We mitigate for fish and wildlife in the basin, you know, the topic that we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about here. And in doing that, we work with tribal partners, we work with the states, we have the Northwest Power and Conservation Council who directs here within the region a lot of the programs and the priorities for how we fund fish and wildlife. We operate 75% of the high voltage transmission in the region. And I've got my 30 second warning, so I gotta speed up. <laughs> but the one thing I would like people to take away uh, from here today as I launch off is that the electricity business is changing rapidly. We have goals to decarbonize in this region. We have goals to electrify other forms of fuel use. And those are big challenges that this region is going to face. We're taking them on. That's why those of us in the electric part of this world got in this world, was to make things better both economically, environmentally, and so on. But we face high challenges, high bars in those goals, even with the Snake River dams. Um, I'd like to also thank the local tribes for hosting us on your ancestral homelands. <clears throat> my name is Deborah Giles. I go by my last name in memory of my father. I'm a killer whale biologist with the University of Washington and the science and research director for a nonprofit called Wild Orca. My research focuses on the endangered southern resident fish eating killer whales, a culturally and biologically distinct population whose numbers are down to a mere 73 animals, down from 98 whales in 1995. This population of whales only eats fish, with as much as 90% of their diet being Chinook salmon. The southern residents co-evolved eating the massive Chinook that historically spawned in the Snake River watershed. <clears throat> Recovering the Snake River salmonids to more historic numbers would significantly help the struggling whales. People in Puget Sound like to claim the southern residents as their whales, but even in the best salmon years, the whales only spend at most six months of the year in that part of the state. The rest of the year, fall through early spring, the whales are utilizing the rest of their range from northern Vancouver Island to Monterey, California. And they spend a disproportionate amount of time in the early spring at the mouth of the Columbia River looking for the returning lipid-rich Snake River Chinook salmon. I saw the southern resident killer whales for the first time more than three decades ago, and I got my master's and PhD degree studying whale behavior changes in response to vessels. In 2009, I started working for Dr. Sam Wasser, who pioneered the use of scat detection dogs to non-invasively sniff out floating killer whale feces. Our first paper based on these samples was published in 2012, and it became evident that vessels are a problem most significantly when the whales are not getting enough to eat. This realization was important because it turned my attention from being focused on vessels um, to being uh, more focused on interactions between food-deprived whales and stress hormones. Our most recent paper, published in 2017, shows that 96, uh, sorry, 69 percent of females getting pregnant spontaneously miscarry their calves, and these miscarriages are directly related to females who are not getting enough to eat. It's important for me to be able to talk and meet with people who do not have a connection to the whales, and so that I can understand the concerns of folks who rely on the dams. 
with the ultimate goal of figuring out if and how the dams fit into the overall recovery goal of the southern residents and the wild snake uh, river salmon and the ecosystems that they rely on. Good evening, my name's Rob Masanis. I'm the Vice President for Western Conservation at Trout Unlimited, which means I oversee our conservation programs from New Mexico to Alaska. I'm based in Seattle, Washington. Um, I have both professional and personal connections to these issues on the Snake River. I've worked on Snake River salmon uh, recovery and dam management since 1993. I've worked on habitat protection, habitat restoration throughout the basin, the relicensing of the Hell's Canyon uh, complex, and the federal dam issues on the Colombian Snake. The Trout Unlimited members that I represent live throughout the Snake River Basin from Salmon, Idaho, to Lewiston, Idaho, to Clarkston, to the Tri-Cities, and they care deeply about the river and its fish. Uh, personally, I'm an avid angler and rafter, and I've had the great fortune of spending many weeks on the Maine Salmon and the Middle Fork Salmon, the Clearwater, and the Grand Ronde over the years. Those have been really powerful experiences. It's been great to be on rivers that are largely intact. And unfortunately for the Snake River uh, rivers and tributaries, um, they're missing the fish that used to go back there um, in the millions. Um, the Snake River has the greatest by far recovery potential for wild fish in the Columbia River Basin of any area in the Columbia River Basin. The one thing that's important to me about Snake River uh, issues is that we uh, advance fish recovery while we meet the needs of people who are dependent upon fish and the people who are dependent upon the dam system. Um, that's going to be something you'll hear from me a number of times tonight. And why do I think that? I think that the only way we're going to be successful is if we unite communities around a common set of solutions that are durable over time and can be robust to the changes that we're hearing about in the electricity system, the challenges um, facing the region with respect to uh, climate change, um, and just the very dynamic environment in which we live. We have to be looking forward um, and not, not in the rear view mirror for the future. Rob, thank you. I'm Rob Rich with Shaver Transportation Company. We're one of the several tug and barge lines that operate on the Columbia Snake River system. I live in Woodland, Washington, and that's a small community uh, about 20 miles north of Portland. The, um, our company is a sixth generation uh, family-owned tug and barge line. We're 140 years old this year. The majority of towboat lines on the Columbia Snake River system are family-owned and uh, multi-generational, so we see a, a nexus there between the communities that we're serving and uh, the kind of the history of the companies ourselves. Our tugs help move the, uh, can you folks hear me okay out there? Thank you. Our tugs move, help move the 1,400 deep draft ships uh, that call on Columbia River ports each year, uh, with nearly half of those being uh, agricultural uh, related transporters. Uh, we also operate a fleet of grain transport barges delivering wheat from as far east as Lewiston, Idaho, through the four Lower Snake River dams and of course the four uh, main stem Columbia dams. Uh, to the export elevators in the lower Columbia River for those deep draft vessels uh, to feed Pacific Rim markets. Uh, we transport at our company over 500 barges a year of wheat. Uh, each barge of wheat is about 3,600 tons. Uh, for the, uh, the ag folks out there, that's going to be about uh, 120,000 bushels, help a little bit, or 135 semis uh, in each one of those barges. And of those 500 that we transport each year, and again, we're only one of the several lines on the river. Uh, about 45, 47% of those are out of the Snake River. So a significant amount of the uh, product that our company moves and takes to market being moved out of the Snake is part of the reason why uh, we feel fortunate to be able to share with you part of the story of, uh, of barging on our rivers at this time. Uh, this is my 41st year uh, in barging operations on the Columbia Snake River system. Uh, certainly the last last three decades uh, we've had this discussion concerning uh, uh, the Snake River dams. I had quite a bit of hair color at that time, but uh, it's, been a, it's been a long period of time working on this. 
Uh, this industry has been a very stable industry for, uh, for my family, the other uh, hundreds of families that work uh, in the barging industry, but uh, it's also been a huge support for the thousands of Washington farm families, uh, as well as the hundreds of families involved in, uh, in supplying the agricultural industry, such as Alex's employees uh, as well. And we're also part of the communities, every community in uh, the Columbia Snake River system that relies on barge transport to get its products to market. Um, my inspiration for being involved in this, we needed to be looking at that um, kind of introspectively there. Um, I want to see to it that the facts and the great value of our system that brings to Washington families get an opportunity to be shared. We have the lowest carbon footprint, footprint transport when it comes to barging. We have the least amount of fuel per ton mile transported. And we're the only form of regional transport that doesn't add further congestion and pollution if we add capacity to that system. The, um, there are many great stories to share at this panel. You're going to get to hear them here this evening. We appreciate being part of this process and especially being part of the solution because we feel the environmental stewardship that our industry brings is a big part of helping Washington State. What's important to me about the issues surrounding the Lower Snake River dams? It's how complex and integrated they are to our Pacific Northwest way of life and how best to balance their great value and operation to us all. We're going to get to hear more about that complexity here this evening. There are no simple answers to what we're here to talk about. This is going to require us all to listen and learn how to understand that this system can serve all of the uses here. I appreciate this opportunity. Good evening. Whoa. Uh, sounded like Alex for a minute there. Uh, my name is Nancy Hirsch. I'm the executive director with the Northwest Energy Coalition. Coalition was founded in 1981. Uh, we're a nonprofit advocacy organization. We have about 100 member organizations, and those are organizations from nonprofit, environmental, consumer, low income, <laughs> civic based organizations as well as energy efficiency and renewable energy companies and electric and natural gas utilities. We advocate for clean and affordable energy in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. And I am based in Seattle, Washington, although not all of our staff are based in Seattle. Um, I've been at the coalition for 24 years. And uh, I was born and raised outside of Chicago, and I decided that I wanted to be deeper into the natural environment, and I've dedicated my career to environmental protection and clean energy development, uh, which was certainly something that I didn't feel a strong affinity for in Chicago. So what's important to me about this conversation? So when I came out to the, to the Northwest in 1996, I really looked at two things learned two things. The first was hydropower. Certainly didn't have that in Illinois uh, at any great amount. And I learned about the vital role that it plays in the regional economy and the importance of it in providing both low cost and affordable electricity, but also uh, a renewable energy resource. And so at the coalition, we're dedicated to building on that hydropower foundation with the next generation of new renewable resources, primarily wind, solar, geothermal, biomass resources. And energy efficiency is a key piece to that renewable energy future. The second thing I learned was the history of power development in the 1960s and 70s in this region, that the region had planned to build dozens of new power plants to meet expected growth in electricity. And a few of those plants were built. But mostly the region chose another path. And it wasn't a simple path. But they, call, they decided to dedicate to, to invest in aggressive energy efficiency and saving energy and maintaining the economic future of the region by developing a lower cost uh, energy system. And that is the part that gives me hope for this conversation, 
The energy system is dynamic, it's changing, there are new resources available to us, and that's the part that I want us to have a conversation about. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Blaine Meek and I'm a farmer. I represent the 50,000 acres of irrigated agriculture that <clears throat> pulls their water from Lake Sacagawea, the area right behind the Ice Harbor Dam. <clears throat> This area, I and my neighbors, we grow potatoes, carrots, apples, cherries, grapes, pears, onions, sweet corn, peas, corn, and wheat, along with other crops. I take great pride in growing your food. I've had the, <clears throat> I've had the opportunity to farm in some other parts of the, the country. I've farmed in the Willamette Valley. I've farmed in southern Idaho, and I've farmed in Utah. And something that I want to make sure, I think more in this audience, understand this, but that I, I try to make sure everybody understands, is what a unique and productive farming area the Columbia Basin is. We have a combination of climate, good water, and good soil that allows this to be one of the most productive agriculture areas in the world. And and that can that that's a verifiable thing. We can we can look at the the yields and the and the quality of produce and things that we can grow here, and it's it's truly incredible. Um, the land I farm is dependent upon irrigation water, and as I, th I think it will be evident to especially to this audience that lives here, if we do not have dependable uh, water supply, we cannot do what we do. Um, those who plant an orchard, plant a vineyard, cannot make that investment if they can't depend on having water through the whole year, especially in the latter months of, of August and September and October, to, to know that they can keep that. And even row crops, potatoes and onions, we've got to have that dependability of water if we're going to be put in the investment to grow these high-value crops. So um, that's the point of view I come from. Uh, thank you guys for having me here, Jim, for having me here and the panelists. Uh, this has been an enjoyable experience for me, and uh, before I got started, I didn't want to get too emotional right off the bat, but I want to thank everybody on this stage because it's been an interesting thing for me to be involved with. So my name is Dustin Ahern. Um, I'm an interloper into your fine state. I'm from the great state of Idaho. Um, I live, uh, well, I grew up um, around Lewiston, Idaho, graduated from high school a little town of uh, Genesee, um, and then at this point I, I live part of the year south of Lewiston where I woke up at 3.30 this morning and plowed eight inches of snow on a six mile long driveway to get here, and then uh, summer months I live in Salmon, Idaho. Um, at this point I own a business called Idaho River Adventures. It's a float boat uh, rafting and fly fishing outfitter business. The main river we do is the Middle Fork of the Salmon. I also do the last 60 miles of the Salmon River, which is the Lower Salmon. Um, I've, I've been involved or sort of interested in this issue, generally speaking, my whole life, where I grew up um, on the breaks of the Clearwater River, uh, breaks of the Salmon River, and then the Snake River. Um, my family historically were farmers. Unfortunately, at this point, my family's land is sold into another ownership, so none of us are farming at this point. Um, the important thing... Uh, I'm not looking at the football score. I'm, lo I'm looking at notes here real quick. So, um, I, I honestly don't have a, an ability to give a brief history of all of the interests that I have in this particular issue other than that I can say I'm representing people who are generally unrepresented, the upstream basin users, small rural communities that rely on salmon fishing when they're salmon to fish for, steelhead when there's steelhead to fish for, but then also non-ag related industry interests that are in the Lewiston-Clarkston area and then the surrounding area. It's, it's sort of my, um, my notion that over the years, at least in my lifetime, we've spent a great deal of money on barge travel and infrastructure to support the ag communities, which is a fantastic thing for us to do. We, we live in the perfect place in the world to do that. but we did that at the detriment to other transportation uh, needs that other industries might have. And so my interest going forward is to be part of the process, 
to be part of the solution, whatever that shakes out to be. Um, obviously, I want salmon and steelhead back into Idaho, in particular, middle fork of the salmon in sustainable numbers. A real quick statistic, and I don't try to get too much into statistics, but report coming out this week, uh, historic salmon red counts in the middle fork salmon. The Idaho Department of Fish and Game started that in 1950. In the early 50s, uh, they counted in the realm of 23,000. In 2019, that number is 161. And those are the last of the wild fish in the Columbia River Basin. So I do appreciate your time, um, and uh, thank you. Great. Thanks, panelists. Um, so the first question, and they tend to bleed together, is just uh, concerns about you know how the processes have evolved or gone on over the last number of years related to the issues that you mentioned. And so we want to hear a couple of thoughts or a few thoughts from panel members and and then a few thoughts about moving forward, what would be helpful, and then we'll, I'll start interspersing some of the audience questions into that. Alex? I came across a paper that I'd uh, written the other day, a speech I delivered about salmon and uh, mostly about Snake River dams 26 years ago. There is a lot we can learn from past experiences, and I hope we can move past litigation, headlines, and news clips that have prevailed over substance and working together. We need to all keep in mind that helping salmon thrive is a shared responsibility. As agriculture, we've done our best to be good stewards. Tom Vilsack, the uh, Secretary of Agriculture in the past administration, borrowed a Tom Brokaw phrase and called farmers average age nearly 60 now, the greatest generation. And in the inland Northwest, their achievements have been legion. The biggest improvements in productivity and stewardship of any generation since crops were first sown 11,000 years ago. Increasing productivity 250% to feed a fast growing world. Reducing waterborne soil erosion 85% through learning how to better conserve the soil through good sound science over the years. Reducing stubble burning 22-fold and reducing dust six-fold. They've been leaders as well as we move forward in collaborative efforts such as the Washington Conservation Commission mentioned in its programs that have, in their words, helped farmers voluntarily restore habitat along hundreds of salmon-bearing streams without threatening farm viability. It's time aggressive steps be taken, thinking of shared responsibility, to clean up contamination along Puget Sound, the fastest growing area in the United States. Toxin levels for southern resident killer whales are reportedly four to six times higher than their counterparts. An EPA study of the Salish Sea states that the decline in salmon is closely associated with the health of Puget Sound, listing wastewater as the main source of contamination. Setting and achieving municipal sewage treatment goals, sewage management goals, cleaning up known containment sites bearing high levels of chemicals no longer used, <coughs> and reducing runoff from highways and storms, it's time to move aggressively forward there to address those challenges. I also think of extraordinary efforts by so many people pulling together to get things done. Those local efforts have been a cornerstone, and I think of the work of Dave and so many other people who have made an impact. Meeting the challenge ahead requires serious work on all hands. All of us, pitching in and doing our share, can make real progress. Working together, we will make it happen. Oh. Um, anyone who rings when I'm talking, you buy me a beer. <laughs> you can so, tell they've been together a couple times now. <laughs> yeah, we're getting to know each other pretty well. So uh, m my big concern is what if more salmon go extinct everywhere in the Columbia Basin? Uh, 
this is kind of David Stick, but I really take to heart what happens to Native American treaty rights uh, if, they're, if they don't get salmon. When the government that we are part of promised the government that the natives are part of uh, their livelihoods for as long as the grass is green in exchange for the land, and this is tr billions of acres, I don't know, the numbers of acres, um, they meant it. That's a treaty with a sovereign bunch of people that we have to uphold. If we make more salmon go extinct, if we get runs so low that um, the Nez Perce get one ceremonial spring salmon a year, we're not upholding our part of the bargain. And um, there are legal ramifications for that, but there's also, to me, tremendous moral uh, ramification to that. Before we get there, my industry, my income will be long gone. Uh, if the treaty nations have to be compensated in meaningful ways for, for not holding up the treaty obligations, it'll be very expensive for everybody, not just in this room, but uh, all across the state. That's the big concern to me that we've been talking about issues of salmon recovery for decades as if it's a football game. I guess there's a big one going on tonight. Uh, and who wins, whose points are, are put up on the scoreboard? That's not it. Salmon are an icon. Salmon are a currency to a people that we're, uh, we don't have the luxury of ignoring those people. We don't have the luxury of ignoring that debt. And I, I, I worry about that for the future. So um, that's it. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Giles, um, can you say a couple words to these questions? And then there's several questions from audience members about ORCA that I wanted to ask. Good. You while you got the we haven't microphone. had any ORCA-related questions at the last two meetings, <laughs> so I'm excited. I just wanted to um, say that uh, one of the great things that Kay, I was part of the governor's task force. I was on the prey work group and the vessel work group. <clears throat> and our job was to come up with um, a kind of all potential recommendations. And then we floated those ideas to the actual task force. And then they um, spent a lot of time thinking and talking about the recommendations out of um, hundreds that we came up with at the um, work group level, um, they whittled it down to 36 recommendations that went to the governor, um, which were addressed in the first legislative session after the first year of the task force. And so as a result of the governor's task force, um, we did make some good progress in, um, in passing four bills related to the southern residents, and most of these were very specific to the Puget Sound region, or the Salish Sea as it's um, more commonly known now. Um, and those bills related to protecting habitat that support Chinook salmon and forage fish populations, for example, uh, taking out the Nooksack um, River Dam, um, also preventing oil spills, a bill related to that, a bill related to reducing vessel noise and disturbance, and finally, uh, reducing sources of toxin, toxic pollution into the Puget Sound. So um, I just, I guess I wanted to um, mention that, that people of, of Puget Sound, um, Salish Sea are working hard to try and address some of the ecological impacts to human development in that region. And, um, but again, the Southern residents only spend uh, half the year at best. And just to give you an a, a example of something that's changed um, over time fairly quickly, since 2013, things have shifted significantly. Last year, 2019, was the first year on record that the Southern residents, no member of the Southern resident community, so again, just 73 animals, no member of the Southern resident killer whale community came into the Puget Sound in the month of June. And they were only in the Puget Sound region for two days in July and two days in May. That's unprecedented. So they were someplace else out here looking for salmon uh, in the rest of their range. And so that's something that's really changing that we're trying to get a handle on, but they're, they're animals like you and me, they have to eat every day. They're not mammals like gray whales or humpback whales who go through long periods of fasting. 
killer whales have to eat every day to maintain optimal health. And so they're going someplace. Ooh, somebody's buying me a beer. Um, so anyway, I could go on. Well, wait, there's another question. You answered one of the questions that people had about kind of the relationship between the Puget Sound salmon and uh, Columbia River salmon for the orcas. Um, but there's also a question about hatchery versus wild uh, fish as well. Could you speak to that a little bit? Um, so the southern residents are this long-lived, large-bodied animal that only rely on salmon, I mean on fish, mostly salmon, um, and out of all the salmon species, specifically Chinook salmon. So they're, they're, um, these are whales that co-evolved with Pacific salmon that would have been massive in the past. Um, we know from records that Snake River salmon used to be um, over, a some of them were over 100 pounds. So that makes it easier to understand how an apex predator, like a killer whale, could just only eat salmon. Um, so those, the whales um, we know need about 300 to 350 pounds of salmon per day per whale to survive. Well, in the past, three, three fish would have taken care of their biological needs. Now with the fish that's, um, you know, we're, we're lucky in the Puget Sound region to get 12 and a half pound Chinook salmon, um, they're having to forage that much longer for smaller fish. And so um, there's that issue. But on top of that, there's just the fish in the Puget Sound region that the whales were after historically just aren't there. And that's part of what's going on with the Fraser River Chinook salmon, um, which is a Canadian issue. But the whales are ranging down into other parts of their range that they would, have, would not have been in in the past. We know from satellite uh, tagged whales that they, they do spend a disproportionate amount of time at the mouth of the Columbia. And, um, you know, the Columbia used to be the largest producer of, of salmon in the world. And so when you're looking at an animal that can be 80 or 100 years old, that's a, that's a long time for that institutional knowledge within that community of whales to keep thinking, gosh, I'm going to go back to those rivers where there used to be salmon. And so they're, they're out here. We don't tag them. They're, they're not being tagged right now. So it's hard to know specifically where they are. But what we can say for sure is that they're not in the Puget Sound region at the times when we expect them to be. Sorry, I'm super long-winded. <laughs> um, uh, with regard to the hatchery salmon, um, hatchery salmon right now are, are vital to the, to the southern residents. If we stopped all hatchery salmon, we would doom the population. Full stop. Um, my personal opinion about hatcheries are that there are better hatcheries and there are worse hatcheries. And um, as a conservation biologist and looking at it from the perspective, the whale's perspective, wild Chinook salmon have the potential to get, um, to, to, to be, they are the ones that the whales co-evolved with. So ideally it would be better to have higher numbers of wild Chinook salmon out there for the whales to find. And then this is a little bit, and I'll be super brief off topic with regard to the dam issue, but it's related to um, fishing issues. The whales right now are not considered a major stakeholder in fisheries management. And so that's something else that really needs to be addressed if uh, we are serious about recovering the southern residents and wild Chinook salmon for that matter. Thank you. So um, I welcome more comments about uh, concerns about the processes that have gone on and, and hopes for something different in the future. And we'll come back especially to the last question at the end. But there are a number of questions from audience members about salmon recovery and the broader issues around what, what is really driving the, the decline in overall um, in the Columbia system and the snake system. And what are the aspects that are critical for salmon recovery, and how does how do the dams, in your mind, fit into that um, overall recovery approach? And I know that there's a number of folks on the panel that have perspectives on this. So maybe maybe Dave, we could start with you. Um. So, first of all, Joel, thank you very much, Katiago. That was very nice. Um, that was that was something I guess in this in this in this discussion that uh, that that concerned us. You know, was that uh, we were kind of being left out of the tribes, we were being left out of the uh, out of the equation, 
relative to uh, the debt, I guess, the guarantee that the United States had made. So to see that perspective now reflected in one of the panelists uh, through these three discussions is really, it's, uh, it's very, it's, that's uh, very nice. The other, uh, relative to the recovery, um, as I say, you know, what we do, the tribe, we're a fisheries department, we implement stuff. So we fix habitat, we release a lot of hatchery fish, um, we're, we're doing everything we can, we're all hands on, hands on deck on uh, everything we can for salmon recovery, but we can only do so much in so many areas. Um, we can't release hatchery fish everywhere. Uh, we can't do habitat work everywhere. Where we're working on habitat is where there's already a problem. So we're not doing anything in the wilderness areas. What we're doing is we're fixing areas that have already been subject to, you know, it's been logging or whatnot stuff left on the landscape that isn't uh, optimal for salmon. That's, that's the habitat work that we have to do. And um, so we can't do stuff in the vast amount of wilderness areas, like I say, in the Snake River Basin. That's why we need to look elsewhere. The tribe's involved in predator management, in sea lions, in, um, in the birds. Uh, we're, we're doing everything we can for out of basin impacts. Uh, our harvest has been extremely curtailed, uh, especially for spring, spring uh, Chinook salmon, uh, the first ones that come in. Um, in some years, you know, there's 10,000 fish that, can, that have to be split uh, between four tribes. So that's 2,500 fish per tribe for ceremonial purposes. There's, there's more tribal members than that. And uh, so, you know, the harvest is restricted. Uh, and uh, the harvest that does occur is really on uh, hatchery supplemented type runs. So it's either steelhead that are produced by hatcheries or it's fall chinook down here in the Columbia River that are supplemented in the Hanford Reach. Uh, that's really where all the harvest is left. So, so um, our harvest abilities are also constrained. So that's why we're looking for these other man-caused um, man caused things that we have to fix. Uh, the last couple of years, we've had some horrible returns. I'm not gonna blame these on the dams. These are largely uh, related to what's been happening in the ocean. And that's a climate change issue, which in my mind is, is a lot larger than uh, working on the dams and something that needs to be addressed as well. And uh, I don't know if we have the, the gumption to do that, you know, as a society, if we can't tackle the dams. But um, so, so the recovery is so dependent on the returns in the wilderness areas. You can't recover spring chinook salmon or steelhead without having the populations in the wilderness areas rebound. It's dependent on those areas. That's the way the ESA has been uh, uh, developed. So that's why those areas are so important. We can't do anything in there. That's why we're looking for outside uh, out of basin type effects. Just a real quick, uh, to it, maybe education, maybe not everybody understands what Dave just said about wilderness area. That's where I operate my business. So the Middle Fork salmon, 105 miles of river, starts in the mountains of north central Idaho, the Sawtooth Mountains, kind of to the south of uh, where the Middle Fork salmon is, Boundary Creek, uh, Bear Valley Creek, Marsh Creek, all comes together and then it cuts the largest intact alpine wilderness area in the lower 48 straight and half. So the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness Area, two point, just shy of 2.4 million acres. Um, pristine habitat. Can't, can't, can't design better habitat for these fish. Um, high elevation, so they, they swim up to over 6,500 feet in elevation, so the water temperature is going to stay cold for them. And the interesting thing to add to what Dave said about the the wilderness and the habitat up there. If you compare the salmon reds, like I pointed out in my introduction remarks, 1950, give or take, I can't remember the exact year, there was 22,000 plus reds in the Middle Fork Basin. Now there's 161. In that same time frame, the John Day River that doesn't have to go up the Lower Snake, um, their salmon reds have stayed pretty well constant. Um, not a super high production river, but you would have expected if there was some uh, problems with water temperature, things like that, the John Day fish would have nosed dove, but that hasn't happened. 
other comments on that? Salmon recovery overall. Rob. Sure. Um, you know, the, the Columbia Basin is a, a, it's a very diverse landscape, and the challenges facing salmon and steelhead vary depending upon what part of the basin you're talking about, right? So the, the challenges in the Willamette are different than the challenges in the Snake, are different than the challenges in the Methow. I'm not saying they're all different. There's some common factors. One of the common challenges for fish that are migrating through the Columbia is the development of the main stem dams and the reservoirs. Um, every time you have a dam and a reservoir, that adds to the, to the uh, challenges presented by the one downstream, right? So, you know, picking up on Dustin's comment about the John Day, you know, if we look at the, uh, the adult return rates for uh, salmon and steelhead, say, in the John Day or the Yakima or the Deschutes, where they have to cross two to th four dams, their survival is consistently much higher than it is for fish that need to pass eight dams. That's pretty straightforward logic and math. Um, you know, at some point when you build dams, you, you, you build too many for fish to get to where they need to go safely. And the fish a million years ago needed high quality habitat, a migratory corridor that they could get through, and they needed a population that's diverse in order to withstand the vicissitudes of mother nature, fire, drought, bad ocean conditions. They needed those conditions a thousand years ago. They needed those conditions a hundred years ago. They need those conditions today, right? But a lot in the human world has changed over time that's creating a lot of challenges. I think for the Snake River fish, um, which was the most productive part of the Columbia system, particularly for spring, summer Chinook and for steelhead, producing over a half to just about a half of all those fish in the entire Columbia River Basin, um, they are not making it through the migratory corridor with survival rates that are high enough to rebuild them. That's true for hatchery fish, that's true for wild fish. Um, so that is a problem that needs to be solved. My organization is on record saying that we think there's compelling scientific evidence that you're not going to recover wild Chinook uh, salmon and steelhead in, in, the, in the Snake River system um, with the four lower Snake River dams in place. And we think there's compelling evidence suggesting that. We're also on record saying if we can come up with other ways of getting those survival rates up and getting fish back to those wilderness areas and using that habitat that's available today, we're all in, right? But we can debate whether or not remove, you know, the, the impacts of removing the dams, the benefits of removing the dams, but in a way, we need to have the, a really deep conversation with everybody who's affected by those decisions, everybody in this room, the people on this panel, where we can really dig into it and understand those impacts, understand the options that we have to get to a better future that works for fish and for people. And we're not gonna make any progress if that conversation doesn't happen, because we're just gonna to continue to be mired in the controversy and the litigation, which has not proven effective and it's proven incredibly costly, right? Over 17 billion now, if you include foregone revenue. And we're, and we're still having some of the lowest returns in the Snake River system on record. All right, that's a, that's a broken system that's not working for anybody. So we need to find a different way forward. Karina, did you want to add to this? All right, I'm going to speak loud. No, you need the microphone. Is it on? There oh, there we go. go. Okay. You have to wait for the power to come on. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think that... <laughs> you got me. You can tell who the jokester of the panel is. Yeah. They sit, well, ne they sit actually, next to each I other. I was going to go back to, to Joel's comment earlier, but it's been echoed a couple of times. And I think the... 
I think the good news is, is that everyone on this panel and the organizations we represent, the, the interests that we represent, I think everyone is looking to avoid extinction and promote recovery. Uh, the real questions come down to how do we work our way through those issues? How do we select pathways? There are choices, there are impacts associated with them. How do we have that conversation? And while the dams, uh, Bonneville Power Administration, we would never say the dams don't have impacts. They do have impacts. They have significant impacts, and we work hard to mitigate those impacts. As I mentioned in my introduction, uh, we work with the tribes, we work with the Conservation Council, we have gone through a lot of litigation that has set up mechanisms for us that has, have told us what we need to do to support salmon, and we're implementing that work, and we're looking to improve on that work. Um, we work, you know, we've been on the opposite side of discussions with Dave before, but we work very closely together because they do amazing work. Um, I, the, the thing that I would say about the way the conversation has gone historically is that there has been too many sound bites and too much characterizations of each other. And if we are really gonna work through these issues, I think we do have to be open and listen to each other, not minimize uh, impacts across any of these topics that we're talking about, because they are real and they make big differences in whether it's in the environment, in a community, in our Northwest way of life. Uh, I had the, I don't know if it was fortune or misfortune of, uh, as a very young employee at the Bonneville Power Administration to be part of a grand experiment in California called deregulation of the electricity market. There was a lot of folks who thought they had that figured out and it ended up very poorly because a lot of people didn't listen to each other in that conversation. I think that's something, and that ended up affecting us up here in the Northwest. These, the effects can be wide ranging if we're not thoughtful and careful. And I don't just limit that to the electricity world. I mean, the, the, the effects of the environment that we're all trying to work on, you know, it's, it's clearly important to, I think, everybody and on this dais and in this room to have a quality environment in this region. And how to achieve that is, is a, is something that we all have to focus on. Um, understanding the complexities and the trade-offs involved in, in these issues is something I think we all need to work harder to do. Um, because if we don't, we will go part way down a road, we will have consequences that we don't like, and we will have wasted time and treasure and hurt people in the consequence. Blaine, did you wanna add something? Yeah, it, <clears throat> just, just to build on a couple of points that were made. Um, as we look at this process, and you know, I'm, I'm a farmer, and so I work every day in a biological system. And my biological system is a field. I have, I have my potato plants. I'm working with the p pests, the insects, the diseases, the, the weeds, and I've gotta have I've got to have irrigation water. I've, I've got the environment that I'm dealing with, the, the weather. And in biological systems, as much as I wish they did, things do not work linear. You think, I want to say, if I do this to, to my crop, then, then this result will happen. And it, and it doesn't work that way. Um, we think we've figured out that one thing one year, and we try to repeat it. And, and the same result doesn't happen. And when I compare that biological system to the biological system we're talking about here, we're talking about oceans, multiple river systems, climate, uh, multiple states, multiple um, users, and, and of course the, the great population uh, increase that's happened over the, the history of, of what we're following here. And so when we on either side of this issue try to oversimplify it with the cause is this and, and, and put all our eggs there. I, I don't think we're, we're being very wise. And, and of course, uh, from my perspective, when we say if we take those dams out, that's going to fix this problem. I, I don't think that would be a, a wise uh, 
uh, application of, of things we know in biological systems. Jim, did you want yeah. to go? No, go ahead. And then I'm going to ask you an, another, a different question, change the topic. Um, and I know it's not simple. Uh, and and we, we get that, uh, the being in the energy side of this conversation, the energy system is complicated and there's lots of different kinds of generating resources. Loads vary by the second. Matching it all, loads and demand is really critical. We've got a complicated system to do that and we do it extremely well. Thank you to the Bonneville Power Administration and any of the utility folks in the room who make that happen. But the system is changing right before our eyes and we want to be eyes wide open when we think about what the system needs. Customer demands are changing. What they're interested in, the kinds of resources they want are different than what they have been. And the new technologies are, are already here in some of the new next generation renewable resources that I talked about, energy efficiency services, the way we manage loads uh, is, is different. Your water heater in your house is a battery and we're just starting to look at how we can control that battery so that you won't even notice the difference but it means if everyone in this room had a chip in their water heater and controlled their load, it would have a significant impact in reducing peak and reduce the amount of variability in the system. Those are the kinds of new technologies that are right, we're on the cusp of deploying region-wide and across the West. And to me, that's really exciting. I, you're right, I don't know all the consequences of deploying these new technologies, but I'm, I'm willing to take, take a risk because we've taken risks before, we've invested in new technology and innovation, and it has proven to be very effective for meeting customer needs and keeping power affordable in the region. And so I, th that's the part of the conversation that I think we haven't had before because the system hasn't been as dynamic as it is today. And one of the things that we've talked about at, at one of the other panels was closing of the coal plants. Because of climate change, we are retiring a whole fleet of coal-fired power plants. And what's the impact of that on the system? And, and there is going to be an impact. And there's over um, 8,000 megawatts of wind and solar on the system today that is being managed by the utilities and the power plant developers. And there's another 5,000 megawatts of wind, solar, and geothermal that are in the planning, permitting, or under construction right now. And there's another 6,000 megawatts of all of those resources that are being proposed. So the pipeline is full. There's lots of resources being developed, and that's not even mentioning all of the energy efficiency and demand management resources that I, that I mentioned earlier, which are also providing services and lowering load. And all that transmission, the power lines that deliver that coal-fired resource into our load centers, that's going to be freed up. So the idea that we have to build a whole new network of transmission for all the new renewable resources, we have to build some, absolutely, because the wind isn't necessarily where the coal plants are, but there's a whole backbone of transmission that is going to be freed up when the coal plants retire. And we need to use that infrastructure. Let's repurpose it. That's an exciting prospect for me. So thank you. Stop there. OK, well, you've answered one of the questions, but I want to give uh, Karen and another panel members a shot at this. Um, so the question kind of gets into a specific. Um, a year ago, the Northwest had to meet load using combustible turbines during an unusual cold snap. The power prices jumped to over $500 per megawatt. The main stem, uh, Columbia, was holding water for a spring freshet. How are we going to meet the 2035 and 2045 renewable energy goals without these dams? Um, you spoke a little bit to that. Um, so I'd like Kernan to speak to it as well. And then 
Um, I think uh, th there, another question here is, if the costs are going down, why does my utility bill keep going up? So maybe you could speak to the, if, if costs are going down, you know, how does the, the customer see those costs uh, translated to them or not translated to them? Okay, there's a couple of questions there. I'm, not, I'm, I'm gonna try, you're gonna have to remind me I will remind one or two you, no more. Problem. Uh, you, know, you know, I think one of the things to start with maybe is today's system. So when I left Portland this morning to come here, uh, we were looking at a region-wide cold snap that was expected to last the week. Don't know what the weather forecast say tonight, but that was what it was at about 6 a.m. this morning when I left the office. And so one of the things we have to do at the Bonneville Power Administration, uh, not only do we market the power, but one of our responsibilities when we're not in the middle of a flood is to manage system river flows for, to meet power and non-power objectives on the river. So whether that be a flow for fish or putting water in the right place to keep the lights on in the region. And our plan for this week when I left this morning was we would be using the Snake River dams to peak to about 1,600 megawatts across those four dams each of the days for the balance of this week. About a little over 1,000, 1,100 megawatts of that would be in the form of flat out energy production and about four to 500 megawatts in what we call reserves. So reserves are what are capacity that has to be set aside for reliability of the system. Because if in cold weather, a line falls down and generation is isolated from the grid, or something breaks at a gas-fired plant or a coal plant, uh, the system has to be able to pick up or else these lights don't stay on. And that's a required service. And it was particularly an interesting setup for this week because what we we had limited capacity at Grand Coulee Dam and Chief Joseph Dam, but we have water there. And we wanted to be able to move that water into the system to get us through this prolonged week. So by being able to move those reserves that might have normally sat up at Grand Coulee Dam down to the Snake River Dams, where there's less water backed up behind those dams, they're pretty much run of river dams, we have a limited ability to back up water there we were able to maximize the ability of the main stem to move water through to keep lights on during this period. So the, the point I'm trying to make here is that the Columbia River system, it's greater than the sum of its parts because we can shift capabilities around on the system to where it needs to be in order to both meet non-power objectives and keep the lights on. As we move into the future, so we're looking at the question in the EIS that's coming up about removing the Snake River dams. Can there be potential solutions to that problem that will take time and additional costs and some risk? Probably. Um, but what that mix will be is still unknown. I will say, you know, we, the, the water heater programs, the battery programs, those are fairly limited in being able today and in the near term future at any kind of a cost-effective level to be able to meet the kind of bulk system needs we're talking about here. Those costs are coming down. They're nowhere near the cost of the resources that we're talking about here that we'd have to replace. So there are things that can be done, that could be done, but they will take time, additional cost, and effort on our part to put them in place. Now I forget the other... Well, the other question deals with the overall cost, which was then reflected in what people pay for their... Yeah, so, well, Bonneville's in the wholesale part of the electric business, so part of this is a retail utility question, and I can address part of it, and I've talked to a lot of retail utilities. Hopefully, I won't get it completely wrong for those who are in the audience. I'm sure you'll get emails if you don't get it right. Uh, yes, I will. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the... so. This is true of um, hydropower, it's true of wind and solar. You, you can talk about your variable costs and the fixed costs of a resource. So it costs, it costs money to build a new resource, capital investment, dollars have to go in. Those costs for new resources tend to be high, right? You build something new, it tends to be expensive. But then you get low variable costs through time. 
And over time, you recover those costs. But those have to go into rate base. They have to be recovered from rate payers or from other sources. Uh, so as we're swapping out resources, we tend to be retiring resources that were already paid for. This is all choices we can make as a society. It's not saying it's right or wrong or indifferent. But you end up putting more capital costs into your rate base to be able to switch out to those new resources. So that costs money. Um, we also, uh, as we're going through and expressing new preferences as a region for the kinds of resources we want, those resources tend to, in the last decade or two, come with more variability in, in and of themselves. And then you need services from somewhere in the system to respond to that variation. And that also takes another kind of resource and, and costs. We at, at Bonneville, our primary job is to serve those preference customers that we serve. I think we're in Franklin County PUD service territory, but I might be wrong. Okay, good. Um, as, as, we, um, as we go through and primarily focus at Bonneville on serving Franklin and Benton PUD and all the other uh, preference customer utilities, as we call them. But we're also serving investor-owned utilities in the region. And they're coming to us today saying, hey, I need to replace my coal plants, but I need some dependable capacity I can call upon when I need it to keep the lights on in my region. Can you provide that, Bonneville? And so we're looking at that and saying, well, first we have to meet our preference customer needs, but then do we have capabilities beyond that? We're looking for ways to help the region move into this kind of change that it wants to do. Could there be other resources brought to bear and added to the grid that could do that? Yes, but that wouldn't be reusing the existing resource base to do that. It would be adding resources and those resources would have costs. Nancy. And uh, uh, I agree with, with much of what my colleague from Bonneville said, Kieran. Uh, and uh, surprised as some may be about that. Um, uh, but the one thing I want to point out is that, uh, and tell a little story that is near and dear to Bonneville's heart, which is there was, there was a proposal by Bonneville to build a large transmission line around Portland and up into southwest Washington. Over a billion dollar transmission line project to re reduce congestion around the Portland metropolitan area and facilitate bringing more renewable resources from the gorge into the Portland and the, the west side. And they spent, I don't know, five years working with the communities to figure out how to put that power line uh, through that metropolitan area. And eventually they decided not to build the power line they decided to do an alternative strategy uh, to, to get other utilities to collaborate with them, to pay large industrial loads to lower their loads during peak times. And they are pushing out any development or consideration of that line for at least 10 years at a lower cost to all of their customers. And it was, it was tough to get there, but they, they got there. And I guess what it says is that the future mix of resources that we're going to use, they may be a little more complicated. And I would hate for us to maintain the status quo for a week of cold Arctic Express like we're having right now. I, I, I feel surely we can innovate and solve meeting our cold snap without just main staying, we have to maintain the status quo. There are other resources. It's, it's harder. Our region has not, because we've had a flexible hydro system, we haven't had to develop the load management resources that other parts of the country have already developed. We're a little behind that curve. But that's really the next wave of resources, which is talking to your customers. Our colleagues at Idaho Power work with their irrigators every summer on load management and, and when they pump in order to, and they pay them 
because it's cheaper for Idaho Power to pay their irrigators to shift their pump schedule than to buy peak power. And that's, that's, they're ahead of the game because they're a, they're a summer peaking utility, but, and it's harder with a winter peaking utility, but that's the innovation we can do and we don't have to do it tomorrow. But we want to, in the next five years, I guarantee you we're going to have a lot more load management resources on our system, reducing the peak that we have in the winter and throughout the winter and through summer, summer uh, events as well. And it's not free, but it is also cost competitive compared to building new resources or maintaining the status quo. Yeah, Nancy, I think it was an eight-year public process and EIS, but, but that you, you described the story well. Um, so I want to um, switch again a little bit. Um, there, there are a whole a lot of questions about salmon recovery and so forth that we'll try to address in our report. Um, but I know that there's a concern that many of you have, and we've heard from others and reflected in some of the questions about the of the economic future of the of southeast Washington and agriculture and and what's needed to move forward um, in terms of both agriculture and supporting agriculture, which is obviously vital and a critical part of southeast Washington, but also the other kind of future economic hopes and interests uh, for this part of the state of Washington. So I wanted to get some more perspective from people on that. We'll start with with Rob. Well, just to start off on that, I, I look at this system that has been developing, at least for the uh, transport of, of products, be they uh, wood products, uh, be they uh, grain products, in and out of the Snake River system. As I look at that, I see that that has been developed certainly since 1961 when Ice Harbor went in, but specifically in the mid-70s, early and mid-70s, when the rest of the system went in. So over a 30 to 40 year period, you have a system that has developed that has given the lowest cost transport option for people that are furthest away from the, the, uh, the exporter. Now when I bring up lowest cost, it sounds like we're just talking about dollars and cents here and somebody's making a profit or somebody's not. What I'm talking about, and actually Alex will be able to speak even better to this than I, is, the, is not only the competitive ability of that product to move, but the competitive viability of it without the ability to move at the rates that the system that has been developed to move, that product most likely isn't going to move. Not all of it, but there will be a significant portion of that product that doesn't move. When we're using these generic terms like product, well, that's actually a farm family's produce that they have put into a truck and taken to the river and moved out. If that product can't move because of pricing, because there isn't a way of transport that has been available and developed over the last 30, 40 years of that Snake River, there's going to be a significant impact. And it isn't just going to be to the farm family. It isn't just going to be to the folks that provide the, uh, excuse me, provide the uh, uh, agricultural products, the uh, fertilizers to make that work as represented up here. But I think of the people that work at Les Schwab. There's 10 or 12 people at that Les Schwab store. If they don't have that transport that's moving down the river, maybe they're only going to need four or five people at that store. I think of the Napa Auto Parts store that's got four countermen. Maybe they're only going to need two countermen. And it just looks like those folks could be repurposed, they could get another job, they could be retrained. But the question is, is that really what the region is asking for? When it gets right down to even just a few jobs, that's a major crisis to the people involved. Where is the balance? Hopefully we're going to be able to get to that a little further here this evening, but there's going to be a point where there's going to have to be a balance for the people that are working on this to be able to say, I'm going to need to give a little more than I thought I was going to give, but I'm not going to have to be giving at all. So there's, there is an economic point there where that's going to have to be looked into, and um, I'll conclude my remark. Alex. 
Agriculture is the largest employer in the state of Washington, employing 160,000 people. And yet it's overwhelmingly a family enterprise. 97% of the land is farmed by uh, individual families. It's a pretty special world. It's a world of small business, too. In many places, we're in 36 towns, as I mentioned before. In many of those towns, we're the biggest employer in town with eight people on board or six people on board. I'm chair of the Rural Vitality Task Force for the Association of Washington Business, and we're very concerned about farm families and those communities that depend on farm families. And yes, transportation is vital to our future. Timely transportation in particular. Sometimes I hear that the use, the need for uh, uh, barges and tugs is going down, actually quite the contrary. And in our own business, I can give you an example of why timeliness is so crucial. We were going full blast this past fall. Trucks, uh, rail, as much as we could get, and barge traffic. Our effort was to bring liquid fertilizers upriver from the Tri-Cities to uh, the port of Clarkston. Why would we do that? Because farmers have a very narrow window for putting fall seed into the ground. We had to move a whole bunch of stuff in a very short period of time. And we rely on all three T's, tugs, trains, and, uh, and trucks. And going full blast, we can't keep up. This past fall, as I mentioned, we were relying on tugs and, and uh, uh, trains and trucks, all three, but we would have fallen hopelessly behind had it not been for tugboats. Delivered by tugs, we had 200, enough nutrients to fertilize 200,000 acres of the Palouse and Camas Prairie regions. Imagine had we had to wait until uh, rail got around to it or until the highways weren't crowded. Farmers would have had to make do with seeding late and every day you delay seeding, you lower your yield potential. But I'm optimistic about the future. I think we could pull together and get things done. I think the road to success for all of us in addressing challenging complex issues such as salmon and orcas and, and dams I think the key is to rely upon good, sound science and local efforts, things we can do out in the field that matter. I think of the work that Dave's done with the Nez Perce, projects with the Yakimas, a recent project led by the Conservation Commission and 18 different agencies that took on the challenge of a voluntary incentive-based program with farm families. What was the goal? To improve habitat for fish. 37 habitat restoration structures were put in and enough sediment saved over a four-year period to have loaded dump trucks that were uh, filled with that sediment all the way from Olympia to the Space Needle. There are so many positive things we can do pulling together. Dave and I were visiting the other day about hatcheries and how some of the hatcheries are so old and poorly funded that the level of hatchery fish has declined because of lack of funding from our uh, legislature. We can do better than that. I think of all the ways we can pull together, it makes me excited about the future. And as a farmer, stubborn excitement and enthusiasm, despite whatever the challenges we face, that's our lives. Um. Joel, and then Dustin, and then we're going to start wrapping up. Thank you. Um, I'm really glad, Rob, that you're here because you're a maritime guy and you kind of understand maritime industries. And, and I'm glad you talked about, um, for any, any region, what, the, what happens when there's economic devastation. Not only do you lose your clerks at the auto parts store, I'm um, pretty sure you appreciate what happens when you lose shipwrights and specialists in marine construction and marine repair especially. Uh, and that's 
what's gone on on the West Coast already. Out in Port Townsend right now, our shipyard provides 20% of the employment of Jefferson County. It's really important. A lot of the work in the shipyard comes from commercial fishing, although those are Alaska-based boats. There's some Washington-based boats. Like myself, I've spent uh, a lot of money this winter. I, <laughs> all, anyway, so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, and I'm glad you understand that, and I'm glad you understand that um, communities around the region have already suffered that and are looking for uh, they're looking for a way forward that's better, that doesn't hurt anybody else. Preston. But uh, follow up just a smidgen with Alex's comments, which were wonderful. I mean, that's, that, that's uh, hard to refute. Um, um, what I would say is uh, I'm happy that uh, all modes of transportation into the Lewiston area were available when you needed to get your fertilizer up there. My, one of my fears and sort of uh, a statement that I made at the other two workshops was the system as we know it and, and all aspects of the system. Um, um, the energy side of the equation, the transportation side of the equation. I don't 100% understand uh, irrigation. I come from Genesee where it irrigates from the sky. So I'm not 100% certain that if uh, the irrigation aspect of this issue is working perfectly for you. But my point is, is none of the other aspects are working perfect for everybody. It's working pretty good for quite a few people, but as it stands right now, I think all interests on this panel would say, gosh, we could use a little help with X. Um, one of the things, going back to the original question to start the whole thing is, is that's concerned me over the years in this issue is, we haven't spent money on that infrastructure that I talked about. And that's what I would say is, is going forward with the money being spent on the lower snake system the way it is right now, we haven't done a whole lot of savings for maintenance. So as the infrastructure ages, the, the, the time that unforeseen lock closures are going to happen are always going to become greater until we expend a bunch of public money to fix them. I don't know if that's good use of public money or not. I bring it up to say, hey, we've got some smart people in this room to say maybe if we need to spend $3 billion on retroing X, Y, and Z, what if we spent the same $3 billion on A, B, and C? I'm not sure, right? So I'll leave you with that. Thanks. Okay, we, I want to start wrapping up. Do you want to make a short yeah. statement? And then I want to together, and I, I appreciate it. Um, this will be your wrap-up. Yeah, <laughs> Alex's comment about, uh, you know, science-driven solutions. and But if you take everything that we've been hearing about, what I'm hearing from Blaine, we need a dependable water supply for ag. From Alex, we need a, a affordable, timely, reliable commodity transportation system for the ag community. We need affordable, reliable power supply. And the fourth goal that I think people mostly share, maybe not everybody, but certainly the one that we have, is healthy, harvestable Snake River salmon and steelhead. And if you look at how the system is working for those four goals right now, we're doing a pretty good job with three of them. We're not doing a good job at all on the fourth. And the numbers bear that out. So I think as we think about the future, the question to me is how do we achieve continued attainment of those first three goals and also achieve the goal that for despite $17 billion and 30 years of effort, we're nowhere near achieving. We're nowhere near achieving and that's affecting real people every day. Thanks. Okay, so um, not everybody has to respond in the wrap up. Um, and if you've already made your point about some of this, please imagine that these are very smart people in the audience and they'll remember it. Um, so just a little caution. So the, the last question, um, there's actually two things um, that were pointed out by audience members. One is that the audience here and the panel itself is made up largely of people who aren't representing the diversity of the state. Um, and especially younger people. 
Um, there are two young people in the audience, which um, I hope that they came because they wanted to rather than their dad told them they had to. Um, but thank you for being here. Um, and there are, the, the audience person asked the question, imagine that most people were over 50. I actually see some faces that I would guess are less than 50 in the room. Um, but it's a question of how do we in the future engage more people? And I'm not asking you to answer all that, all that question in your remarks, but just to put it out there because I think it is an important observation and a question of how we bring more people into this discussion, especially in the culture and world that we're in when our attention is more to 30-second uh, videos than it is to this kind of conversation. Um, but the, uh, the question that I wanted to end with, which is, I like better than the one that I had, is what's an important consideration or perspective that you've learned going through this process? One, um, that just speaks out to you. Maybe somebody you talked to that you wouldn't have otherwise. It's something that you're thinking about that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And it plays into that other question about what would you like to see happening that would be helpful into the future to move these issues forward? I, I appreciate that. Um, I have a different answer to this question than I did at the first meeting, and it, and it comes from the conversation of, of having this. Um, what's really stuck out to me, and you know, this, this happens to us, a lot of us here in Tri-Cities, we, we hear of pulling the dams out, and it, and it just seems crazy to us. It it's, it's just doesn't even seem that real that's that that would be a, a good idea. And, and I'm not talking about my neighbor farmers, I'm talking about who I'm sitting next to at the basketball game Friday night. And so I had to, through this process, and I think I have a greater appreciation for what Jim probably went through in, in talking to us and the many other people he talked to through this process. I certainly hadn't taken the time to understand uh, the, some of the other perspectives and, and I've learned some things. That doesn't mean I agree with, with everybody else's point of view, but there is a lot more common ground than I thought there was, and, and I think there's more joint solutions than I thought coming into the process. And Dustin, if you irrigate, you can't go fishing much. <laughs> Well, this, uh, this, this process has given uh, an incredible opportunity for many of us, and I'll speak just for myself, to be able to be not only exposed to, to the, the different perspectives, but the, the depth of knowledge that those perspectives have, the, where they're coming from. What I'm, what I'm getting at is, is this. When we spend our time in courts, we become very entrenched. I'd, I'd made a comment here, entrenchment is security. If we choose to remain entrenched, well, we're, we're going to end up with the same result. But being able to sit up here and get to meet some people that I've, I have heard of over the years, to hear some um, expert uh, background that uh, would not have had the opportunity to hear, I'd like to say I'm kind of a plugged-in person, nowhere near as plugged in as I needed to be to understand so many of just the basics that many are dealing with uh, in this basin. Jim, you, you ask a good question. How do we involve more people? And, and you made a, a reference to, uh, uh, or maybe the question is something to do with uh, over 50, something like that. Well, for, for many people, you get to a stage in life where things that are going to be happening in the future really mean a lot to you. That could have something to do with some of the, uh, the age demographic here in the room. How do we get younger people more involved? We're going to have to demonstrate to them how what is going on directly affects them, whether it is the agricultural community, whether it's the restoration of the, uh, of the fishing opportunity uh, for harvest, whether it is the balance of hydro with, uh, with conservation. They hear these words, they hear these terms. Everyone in the room is here because we have an interest in it. We already know it, we're preaching to ourselves. But when it comes to involving younger people, it's got to mean something to them. I'm not an expert in that area, but you ask a good question. That was the first thought that came to mind is we've got to make it important to them. Thank you. Others? 
They're shy now. They think they already made their closing remark. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go. Um, I'm kind of flippant, so um, bear, bear with me. How do you get young people involved in whatever industry you're in? Well, um, you don't see any cat videos with cats riding on tractors, right? I mean, so that's the first thing to get kids to think about agriculture is cats riding on tractors. I'm uh, not sure we should be asking people over 50 how to get young people involved, but go ahead. <laughs> well, that, that, that is a problem. You have to ask people under 20 how to get young people involved, and that, that is the issue. So uh, uh, about collaboration over difficult issues with uh, a wide variety of very entrenched and adverse stakeholders. So I sat through what is known as the Bolt decision over on the west side and USV Washington. USV Oregon, which is Columbia River Fisheries Issues, and really briefly, everybody wanted to kill everybody else in the 70s and 80s, and instead of doing that, literally, uh, they went to court, and they sued the heck out of every, everybody sued the heck out of everybody else, and that lasted to the early 1990s. Unfortunately, or rather fortunately, uh, one entity continued to win because they had treaty rights. That's, it's, that's the treaty tribes. The, uh, that evolved into uh, what is known as the North of Falcon, but it's simply a co-management system between the tribes and the fisheries entities to make a better future. Um, that's been translated in, from what I understand, I'm not an expert on it, in the Yakima Integrated Water Program where water users, salmon uh, enthusiasts, and everybody else have realized that in order to get stability in their region so they can even talk about future, is that they better come up with a plan that's staged and well-funded. And so that gets to the last part, about how, do you, how do you go forward? If the region is in conflict, if the West and the East uh, pretend that there's a, con a cascade divide, if environmentalists, fishermen, and everybody else are in court fighting with each other, you can't get funding. They prove that in Yakima, they prove that in uh, USV Washington, USV Oregon. Uh, at some point, there has to be a couple of good common goals that we're all going to be in agreement on, and we go together, east side and the west side of the state, to Congress. Uh, we probably go with Idaho and Oregon at the same time, and we say, we have fairly large problems. We have some pretty simple programs that only cost, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 billion dollars each that can be funded over maybe 15 years, something like that. So let's start enacting legislation to get that. I think it's possible just looking at what happened in Yakima and also looking at the Bolt decision. Where, I mean, literally there were people wanting to shoot each other and that's stopped. They're out of court and they're maybe not working happily together, but they're working for a better, uh, more fish, better future for them. Uh, uh, I see hope. I think about that task, that opportunity to reach out to young people and think that's a challenge that all of us face. It's a really vital challenge. We work as agriculture. I mentioned earlier average age now pushing 60 of, of farmers. We work to help people understand what a tremendous field of opportunity this is. There's nothing static about agriculture. Things are moving forward in, a, in an exciting way. We heard earlier how that's true in the world of energy. That's certainly true in the world of fisheries. We have to spend more time reaching out to young people and, uh, and telling our exciting stories. How do we work together better in the future? We have efforts such as this endeavor where we spend time working together, comparing notes, learning from one another. That's a very valuable process. And litigation, uh, news headlines, and, and uh, oversimplification are a poor path to go down. Working together, people with diverse interests, such as, as you've heard from all of these fine panelists, pretty exciting. That's how you get things done. I'm excited about the future. Because I think we can do that. I think we can avoid draconian solutions that are not solutions at all. 
silver bullets that are not really silver, but find ways to work together and get things done, keeping the salmon run strong, keeping agriculture in the inland northwest strong and cohesive as well. It can be done. All of us pulling together will make it happen. Okay, Dave, and then we're going to, one more after that, Nancy, and then we're going to close. Okay, two more, three more, but you have to be brief. <laughs> so, so relative to, to uh, youth involvement or, you know, I, I am optimistic about that when I, when I follow the news, you know, and see how many young people are really concerned about what's going on uh, in their world environmental issues that is that is promising you know they don't seem to be as as uh, parochial or as limited here as the lower snake issue but there's a lot of interest in those larger things so that gives me that gives me some optimism i i'm kind of ashamed that they are the ones that ultimately are going to be responsible for doing something to fix you know what what has gone before but but i'm optimistic that they're going to do that um relative to the to the group uh, or getting more people involved, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think that the people that are here in the room, the people that are on this panel are probably uh, going to be the ones that are going to deal with this and solve this. And uh, so I don't know if, if uh, getting a whole lot more public attention, um, you know, wherever. I, d I don't know, um, I think, you know, how effective that's going to be. I do think that the solution is going to end up coming from, you know, people like, like ourselves and, again, uh, you folks in the audience because it's something that you're, you're very much interested and you're, you're invested in, in uh, seeing something done on that. Kernan and then Nancy and then Jaya, who, who's the last? Uh, on, on the issue of the youth, I guess what, what I would encourage is, is I think um, there's a lot of fascinating, basic information about all the topics we've talked about today that I think young people are actually interested in and, and will eat it up. And I think it's important to get that base in place. I think at, at times we go straight to how do, how do you encourage someone to take a position when what we need to do is educate people and let them take positions of their own. Um, it, you know, with regard to uh, going forward, I guess the thing I think about is that I think to the, like some of the issues that Rob raised earlier about uh, encountering dams and the impacts that that has on fish. And there, there are good scientists that take differing opinions on that. But, you know, there was an example about a little more than a year ago this time. We got together with the Nez Perce, we got together with Oregon, the state of Washington, and we said, is there a way that we can increase spill, which reduces the encounters fish have with, with powerhouses, uh, preserve power production when we need it, and, and implement that in a way that's ongoing sustainable. And we have an agreement in place now. It's, it, uh, it, it will, went last year, it'll go again this year, um, to implement what we call the flexible spill agreement. And that was done outside of the courtroom by sitting around, talking to each other about what our, what our challenges and needs are. And I think it's those kind of examples that we need to build upon. Uh, we're going to look at dam breaching as part of the EIS that, that we're bringing out soon. We're also going to look at other issues about how can we improve conditions for fish. So I think there's going to be an ongoing conversation here, and, and there is an opportunity for people to engage in that. Nancy and then Rob, and then we'll... Wrap it. Um, I have been uh, super happy about the in exchange of ideas and information on, among the panelists. And in hearing the questions from the audience, uh, I've been in two of these workshops. Um, and it makes me optimistic that if we sit down and talk to each other and share information and, and talk to each other about what we really need as opposed to our positioning, um, we can find solutions. And uh, that part of that is just a dialogue and committing the time. Uh, as Dave said, there's a, there's a pretty wide ranging group of folks sitting at this, on this uh, panel. Uh, and if we spend a little more time talking 
uh, in the next few months, uh, we might we might find solutions uh, that we all can get behind. And as far as young, young, younger audience members uh, in the future, clean energy is filled with young people. Uh, cli the climate movement is filled with young people. Um, people are investing and engaged in the climate movement and in clean energy solutions. So when we, if we want to engage uh, our community, we have to think about how we frame the issues that we're talking about, and that will bring uh, more young people out into the into the audience. Yeah, I, I want to uh, agree with everybody on the panel who said that they're encouraged by the dialogue that we have among ourselves, but also I, what I perceive to be a growing dialogue across stakeholder groups in the region to solve this complex set of intertwined problems. I just want to uh, note that I think we, uh, we need, this, this is going to be a big lift, right? There's no low hanging fruit left. This is gonna require a massive investment in the system, looking ahead, trying to envision what this region looks like that works for ag, works for the fish, works for power, and we have a political delegation in the Pacific Northwest that's quite powerful. It's going to require a lot of money. And so we have an opportunity, if we do, are successful in coming together, to actually build bipartisan support for solutions that work for everybody. That's not going to happen if the region's divided. And, and it still is, politically. I don't have to tell anybody that, right? It depends on where you're sitting in the basin, which party you're, you, you're affiliated with, pretty much where you come down on these issues. So that's not a recipe for success for solving these problems. And the political leadership is going to follow the leadership of the affected communities and people. So the first step is for us to come together. That will give the political leaders an opportunity to lead, and, and I'm hopeful we can get there. Great. Thank you. Um, so I want to wrap up a couple minutes late. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> This is our last workshop. Uh, we got over 50 questions. Uh, thank you for your interest. Um, as I mentioned, we'll try to summarize them and provide responses in our final report. Um, the deadline for written comments is January 24th. If you have comments on the comment cards here now, please turn them into one of us. Um, we're happy to take them now. Um, and I just wanted to say, um, to the question about one perspective that you learned through this process, I've got about 50, um, but I wasn't asked the question. So, um, but it's been a real honor to be part of this um, and to support these folks. Uh, at the previous workshops, people asked uh, how they were picked. Um, I picked them um, from the people that we interviewed. As I mentioned, over 90 folks. There are other folks that we could have easily filled the panel with um, the predominant reason for picking them is that they are interested, as you heard tonight, in understanding the perspectives and the values and the interests of others, and I'm hopeful that by doing that, they can come up with solutions that haven't been moved forward as of yet, and that that creates a better future for all of the issues that we talked about and what we've seen in the past. And so I'd just like to have you thank them with your applause. Um, and then the open house will continue for a while. The panelists will be here for a while if you want to ask questions of them. Um, so please, a round of applause. And please drive safely home. This was